Happy Friday, oh. everybody. Uh, hey. Welcome to our Friday workflow webinar. Uh, we're excited to be talking about um, monitor mixing for broadcast shows. So uh, we have some really great panelists today uh, that we have brought in. Uh, Tom Pisa, Mike Parker, Andre Barango, and Jason Sears. And uh, just a reminder, just a little housekeeping, those of you who are tuning in, uh, there's a questions area. We'll be monitoring that over the course of the webinar. So do feel free to jump in and ask questions of our panelists. Uh, we're gonna kick it off and uh, hear a little bit about what these fine folks, what they do and how they got into this. So let's start with Parker. Hey, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, back in the day, I used to um, mix monitors and, and go through all the clubs back back in the day, which was the Whiskey, Rosky, Rick, Whiskey and Roxy and all those shows. Uh, and uh, the Country Club was a big one that, that kicked it off for me that um, helped me learn, you know, the basics and stuff like that for really mixing front of house and monitors. And uh, Oh, looks like, looks like my guy's here. Anyway, but, uh, and then I eventually, you know, got into touring and, uh, you know, and mixing uh, television. So that's basically, you know, my start working in clubs all the way up to touring and then eventually, you know, landing a job in television. So. And what are your main shows these days? Broadcast. Um, Broadcast shows are like, um, I would say Grammys, Oscars um, are the annual shows and BET awards. But then you have, uh, uh, you know, Mask Singer, America's Got Talent and American Idol. Those are, are, are shows that continuously coming back. Uh-oh. Every year, so. <laughs> okay. Cool. A couple, <laughs> a couple that I do. Nice. So, um, but, All right. You know, it, it, they keep me busy. <laughs> they keep me and crazy. Sorry. All right, Tom, you uh, want to jump in? What's and your... Then there's, uh, what other oh. shows are I have? Yeah, Go <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> right. Yeah those, yeah, those trophies up there. You got a lot of, a lot of gigs. <laughs> well, it was a long, it was a long road to get here. Parker knows. Yeah. If I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got started. Um, you know, a lot of people start out as a musician, and it naturally goes into audio mixing. It seems there's, there's an awful lot of us. Um. I went out to L.A. to go to music school and to be the next best drummer in the world. And I was fully convinced that was my path and nothing was going to stop me. And Parker remembers when I was 18 years old, it started as a day job. Oh, apparently yeah. in the West. And I was 18 going into that shop just to uh, help paint PA cabinets for a Neil Diamond tour because they had just bought Stan all sound. Um, at that point, I was still playing in band in a band that was um, playing the Troubadour and the Roxy and the Whiskey and stuff like that. But also, as you get into the recording world and, re and the record industry, you kind of meet some different people. You realize what it's all about. It's a lot of questionable characters. I started to realize I enjoyed the company of a lot of these audio greats that I had a chance to work around, learn from, and do all of that. So really, at Maryland Sound, I learned the touring industry uh, that segued into meeting Mike Stahl, of course, and guys like G Parker. Um, and when audio tech, when Mike Stahl went over to audio tech, kind of a long road to get to there. But once I did get there, that's what the TV audio portion of my, my career started. And, you know, you work your way up from the bottom and you're coiling cables and pulling feeder and loading trucks and doing everything else. And then somebody hands you the keys one day and tells you to mix some act and do something. Or can you do this show? You think you can mix monitors and 
you say yes. No matter what, you say yes, and you take the plunge <laughs> and sink or swim. And pretty much, you know, a lot of people ask, what school do you go to to learn what you do? And it's the school of hard knocks. The way I came through it and the way a lot of us did, you, you learn from all of the greats that came before you. You keep your mouth shut. You keep your composure and your, your humility. You take every day as a lesson of learning something new and you just get better and better and better at it. And before you know it, you're, you know, mixing some broadcast monitors for on a broadcast. It's going out to hundreds of millions of people. So uh, it's an odd, windy road that gets you there. But if you keep your eyes on, you know, what you're doing and that's all I can say is a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, don't get down on yourself. Take every day as you're learning and, you know. But, that's it. So I guess to end it, I would say, yeah, I wound up being a monitor mixer on a lot of recurring shows each year, like Grammys, Oscars, Super Bowl. Um, they happen each year. I hope they all come back and eventually start to happen each year. It's been a really odd year for for the entertainment industry and for any any venue based type crowd based you know industry. Uh, but those are the shows that, that are my bread and butter now, and I've had some success with them. And it's all these people I get a chance. They're like a family. You know, the, the uh, crews that do the show are like a small, tight-knit family. And I really appreciate it. I miss it right now, but, you know, that's it. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Andre, do you want to jump in? How did you get into this like Tom, I, I started, uh, I was a bass player and uh, got tired of paying for rehearsal studios. So I started my own rehearsal studio and ended up with 10 rooms and did that for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And then I ended up at center staging. Um, and at center staging, <clears throat> I kept going over to Audio Tech to rent gear. And I, that's where I met Tom Pisa and uh, all the guys. Um, and it just took progression of time. And eventually I ended up over here at Audio Tech, um, where I became a project manager, one of the uh, monitor mixers, and also the techs for, I've teched for Dave Velty. That's how I first started, was teching for Velty. And then um, after that, it grew into teching for Velty and for Parker. And then I started teching for Pisa as well. Um, in fact, one of my first shows was Pisa wanted a tech for me, which was awesome. And it was with Gugush. Gugush. <laughs> <laughs> and the saxophone player dove his microphone into the wedge and it fed back. And when I looked back at everybody, there was like, what, 10 people sitting next to Tom and they all applauded at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah <that> was, <laughs> But then after that, um, I think a year after that was around 2000, 2001, um, I ended up working full time for Audio Tech and became a project manager over here. Cool. Jason, how did you get into this? Um, I was I was always around um, music and production. My dad was a musician. He he toured. He was an MD. He he played um, played trombone classically, and he's a music as a music educator. So I was always around it, and so growing up, I just kind of just was just always around this this certain type of um around stages and and players and stuff. Um, I I start off. I was playing drums as a kid. And, you know, thought that was going to be the thing. Went to school with a bunch of, like, really, really good drummers and good musicians and figured out that probably wasn't going to be the thing for me. Um, and so I got into uh, production. Did a bunch of corporate stuff for years, you know, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but really focusing on audio. And um, at, when I was trying to make the, the change out of the corporate stuff, I um I ended up talking to um a family friend of mine and he actually put me in contact with Mike Parker. 
this is a little ways back. So, you know, I, I called him like every week for like eight months or something. Finally, a show popped up and he's like, well, let's see, let's see what we let's see what we could do. I got on that show. And then so he was the first guy that I ever tech for on a television show. And and after that, that was that was a wrap. I was I, you know, we got on other shows. Um, we uh, we did the voice together, started that one up. Um, I, I tech on I tech for, on the voice. I tech on America's Got Talent the Emmys, um, the Grammys, and I've um, started mixing a little bit on shows. I, I mix monitors on The Masked Singer and, and um, you know, on The Voice and America's Got Talent. I've, I've also mixed monitors on those shows as well. Okay, perfect. Well, actually, it's kind of great with this conversation that you all have worked together um, because with these large scale shows, especially the award shows, it's clearly there's a lot to do. So um, can you elaborate on some of the roles? So what is like, Andre, you mentioned your project manager, there's the monitor mixer, there's the monitor tech. What are the responsibilities for when you're in these different roles? So it starts for me, it starts off as being the project manager where I'm getting all the information from producers. Um, and from there, I get drawings and everything. I build my list for the show and what our PA needs and our monitor needs are. Um, and then from there, we take it to the show, build it, um, tech for, you know, and then my job starts as a tech on site, but also I have to project manage the show still. So that takes. Sometimes it takes away from my teching ability if I have to go take care of a problem. Uh, Parker likes to call it I'm CEOing at the time. Yeah, CEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just me carrying the project through from beginning to end. And in the middle there, I end up with everybody on the show. And um, as, as uh, artists come on I'm, I'm still you know adjusting what what the show needs are and that's that's when it starts to take me away from my teching job but now that we have two techs mostly on shows <clears throat> the other tech like if if it's me and jason on a show um teching for parker for instance jason can take over the stage while i'm gone dealing with a fire somewhere else now i'll come back and resume with everybody All right. So Jason, do you want to elaborate on what, so what are the monitor tech duties? Like when, when does your job start and what are you responsible for? Um, usually uh, we come in on pre-cable day, which is a day before the main ESU, which is like the main setup days. And um, the monitor tech's going to run all, all the cable and infrastructure that has to get put in four monitors which is you know everything from um downstage wedges and upstage wedges and in, in multiple places of the stage um putting up side fills uh working with if there's two if there's two stages so on some some big shows like the grammys there's two stages so there's an a and b stage and so there's um teams that work on these both stages, we, we get together and, and try and figure out placements for things. Um, a lot of the shows we've done for years, so it's you know remembering how we did it the year before. Also setting up the 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 in ears and um, getting uh getting all the packs ready and and getting all the um the transmitters and everything working with the the, the radio guys to Soundtronics to get the um our frequencies making sure all our, our channels are clean. <clears throat> and um, that's usually just like a, a, a first day thing or first couple day thing, just trying to get all the infrastructure and everything up and going, making sure that our mixers are all set and they're in their positions and, and they're happy and ready to go. 
Okay. And then Tom and Parker, you know, as the monitor mixers, how do you, how do you, you know, what are your duties? And then, you know, when you have multiple stages, how does, how does that work out between two monitor mixers? Well, uh, you know, starting off, they, you, you basically have, a, you know, when you have an A and B stage, one thing that, that particularly you have to worry about is like, normally we only have one Pro Tool guy. So a catchy thing is if Tom has Pro Tools on his, on A stage and, uh, I'm segueing into Pro Tools. You know, you got to keep your Pro Tools muted. That's that's like a big thing. You know, for me, it's it's you know keeping your your uh, Pro Tools muted until you know five, four, three, two, one, and you open up. You know, for uh, your performance. That's that's one thing you got to look out for. But uh, you know the and plus Pisa. You know, you you could uh, elaborate on the when you're working with the when you're working with the A B stage, sometimes you have <clears throat> um, one one performance taking up the whole stage. So sometimes you have to um, dial in uh, submix uh, side fills or something like that, or downstage wedges for artists. Or if they're in ears, sometimes you have to send an in ear mix to a certain individual. Uh, and and make it work that way so yeah. you know it's very interesting so yeah i mean to, to just expand on that one um i feel like what we witnessed right before everything just kind of stopped the shows <laughs> every every year they were getting bigger and bigger and more ambitious um production was just kind of hell bent on making every massively complicated performance that you could imagine which with uh, mashups and different people coming in and out so really when it's at full stage like that parker and i have um a lot of back and forth a lot of interconnectivity that we also have to have a lot of trust um when you're dealing with your artists on your side but it's a full performance and he's got his artists you know like he said you're creating mixes for him to send as a complete package over to somebody on his side just so they can reference what's going on on the other it's it, it gets very complicated but you have to just keep housekeeping it and also you know jason and andre it, from the from the console through us on down to the deck is one just seamless extension you know one after the next of people that all have to keep that housekeeping really <clears throat> right this, they're the ones down there at the end of the day, they see the expression on the artist's face when something's either right or wrong. And in a situation like that, you know, which also this segues into something like a sound check and a production timeline, you know, they're very ambitious. They want this stuff to happen um, ASAP. They want 20 people to be on stage that have never rehearsed a full run through of a song and just bam. <laughs> so those guys down there running interference and dealing with artists, it's, it's a, it's quite a, I don't want to say a tangled web, but there are a lot of moving parts to it that everybody has to do their, um, they have to execute their job well, but also, like I said, that trust that you have that, look, that guy's got my back. I know he's going to come through with it. He's going to mute when I'm unmuted, et cetera. It's very, you know, there's, that's probably the biggest thing about it is a lot of trust. And, and the fact that we've done this together a long time, you know, there's a lot of, um, right, right. I can I, I know what Parker's going to do, and I can bank on it, and I can rely on it, and Andre and Jason and guys like that. So, yeah, I have one experience where actually Pisa took over the show for me, which was the ACM. But uh, uh, a certain gentleman was my deck person at the time, and <clears throat> we had three artists on a satellite stage that segued into a really big artist, which was, you know, he had a, it was like George Strait, which had like 10 mixes. And then we segued into, uh, I think it's uh, Jimmy something Johnson, I forgot his name, but anyway, what happened was 
you have you, you, that certain individual that was on the deck taking ear requests had like eight mixers around him. And he, you know, just, <laughs> you got to be able to manage, uh, you know, people in general, just start with your people skills. But man, it was, it, it, you know, that becomes a mess, a total mess. And you, you know, Pisa, you've seen it before, even when you, <laughs> when we had a, what was it last year at the Grammys or, or uh, earlier this year? I think you had the, didn't you have the uh, smorgasbord of uh, engineers around you that, that you have to manage? Yeah. This, that, that's, a, that's a difficult too. That's people skills right there. Yeah, this, this year was my year, but last year, two years ago or two Grammys ago, I think that's the picture Jen just popped up. That's, that's you with all the Dolly Parton tribute. Oh. And I think at one point, not in this picture, but at one point, you easily had 10 different guest mixers all lined up and they were like taking numbers, man. That artist would hit the stage for their part and then the other guy would back okay. out and the guy would go in and start talking to Parker about what they need. Oh, it was hilarious. Oh. I, was just, I was just watching it from my position because at that point that year, they put us side by side kind of, you know, together. Right. And I just watched right. it. You know, it's it's great how you develop a relationship with a lot of those guest engineers anyway. So, they're, you know, you get along good. There's always one or two in the bunch that are just the world revolving around them. So you have to deal with them correctly and make them understand what this is all about. So you're satisfying their needs, but you're also keeping production on schedule and not allowing things to go off the rails because ultimately production hired you to keep things uh, together. Right. You know? Go happen. So it's there's some uh, it's time management involved. Yes, people skills. Yeah, and yeah. and by the way, uh, you do get cer certain artists that that will send you an email thanking you too at the end, which is which yeah. is great too. You know, I, I, yeah, that's I have a, a list of friends. I I call them friends. They I even I might even only see them once or twice a year, but they are friends. We stay in touch. And it's a long list of people that are guest engineers that are on tour with these artists. You know, they know them intimately. So I rely on that relationship that they they have and they rely on my relationship with production. So it's it's a it's a good relationship with a lot of guest engineers. And I look right. forward to seeing right. them and working with them. You know, and there's again, that's another trust situation and a lot of emails where you do pre plan and pre dial. And, how early do you, does the conversation with the with the artist engineers start happening? Five minutes before. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Although it can't It'd be, I would say anywhere from five minutes before to five days. And when you get, sometimes you get the real go getters where they got one artist and it's they live and breathe that artist and they don't leave any I undotted or T uncrossed. They'll get a hold of you two months ahead of time to start talking about how the performance is going to be. And you don't even know what the stage looks like yet or, or anything. Right. But can, I have to give them props. They have their artists in, in mind. And so, yeah, you yeah. could be a month out answering emails about a five minute song on a 20 act show. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, it is too. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up to some of the setup situations. Let's see if I can pull up. Um, I had a couple of pictures from AMAs that I wanted to bring up. Um, so I wanted to see if you could talk through like what your in ear monitor setup was, like how you set it up between stage A and stage B. And I think Jason, this is your side of the stage, yeah. um, and how you go through prepping and organizing. Uh, the ear packs for the show. So when we, we get our packs, it looks like, you, you know, we can have, I don't know, 50 packs or whatever, 12, 16 transmits. And, and um, we, we get our, our, our list of acts and we figure out who does what act. And then we map out how many players in talking to the guest engineers we, we see how many players are going to be in each act, and then we allocate packs for each one. When I initially set up the stuff, I I um I get all my packs, make sure that all the settings on every pack is 
the way I like it um, and the way, the way we want to do it for the show. And then I put all of the frequencies into the cue mode so that every pack can be any pack at any given time. So I don't have to, like, if I'm looking around for ear channel three, I don't have to fish through 50 packs to find three. I can just pick up one pack, no matter what it is, go through the queue and, and make it that. And then we have these tins and we'll fill the tins according to the act. So a lot of times the guests, engineers, you know, they, they wanna get their, their packs early so they can go and get them into their artist's clothes, wardrobe or whatever, so they're not rushing and making sure that everything's all nice and tight and buttoned up. So they'll come and get their stuff early. We can hand a tin of their packs and it can be, you know, from one to, you know, 12, 12 packs, something like that for one act depending. And that's just ears. And so that's, um, that's usually the process. I definitely use Q mode. I think that the <clears throat> packs are the are the are just the best tool for for doing you know large scale production like this. I really wouldn't want to do a show without them. I really would not. It's 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 kind of it's it it makes the the flexibility is is fantastic and it makes things much easier. And that's a pretty regular award show setup with the packs in in Q mode at this point. At least every show I do, every okay. single show, even if it's not an award show, every show I do, you know. Oh really? Okay, so every just a general usage. I, I I do it the same way every time, and then I don't have to worry about anything, and then and it's always easy. I'm all about trying to make it the easiest way because there's always going to be some variable that has nothing to do with me or audio, you know, it's like, you know, if they, if they change, if they change an act and that act comes right after another act. And, and if they, if they, sometimes the acts will, will play right into each other. And so you might need to change a channel because these two performers are on the same channel. You know, and if they're segueing right into each other, you can't have two people singing on the same channel. So you might have to change the packs or whatever so that they're not hearing the same mix. And, and so there's the flexibility is, is is really important. So I always do it the same way. Um, all the all the guys that I work with, we we all do it the same way. Billy McCard just, you know, we kind of just um, we set up our our the games and all that stuff. In, inside the packs the same way and we and we all use Q mode that way to to be able to get around the shows more fluidly it's it's definitely a workflow that every show uses the exact same way um even almost even setting up the monitor console i think we're all pretty close to how we do that and yeah. with especially with the ears um, you know if if something should happen to jason on a show i can step right in and go this is what's going on because we are, we all have adapted the same workflow and it's for every, every show is pretty much the same way definitely i think that the relationship between like a monitor tech and a monitor engineer is is probably one of the one of the tightest ones in 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 our in our audio department for sure because it's it's such an extension when you're back in it, there's so much communication that a monitor tech has to have with, you know, the DGA and, 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 you know, lighting and effects and the artists, you know, and then there's a special attention that you have to give the, the, the main artists, but you can't forget the band and, and all that stuff has to happen on stage. And then you have to convey all these different um, lines of information to your mixer to make sure that everything stays on track. So being being able to communicate well and and being able to get along is a huge <laughs> thing. So, you know, we 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 like like Pisa said, we work very closely together and it's like when you're in the trenches and you're trying to figure something out, and you you have to have trust that you know that the guy that you can't you can't see what he's doing and you don't know where he is, but there's a problem. You have to know that he's gonna be able to get that problem worked out and and convey to you, you know, and, and 
in a time frame how long it's going to take to get something done because the world where we work it's all measured in in seconds so i mean i've seen i've seen i've i've made things happen with literally seconds to spare like counting 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 back from commercial we're already back from commercial and the host is talking and we're <laughs> still like working on something and walking off stage right where they're cutting to the artist singing and that's happened you know multiple times throughout my career so it's it's all trying you have to be cool under pressure and you have to be able to communicate and and the trust is a huge thing yeah usually usually jason and, and my in position as as a tech we're the last ones to say yes we're ready to go yeah and and yeah, true. usually we're the ones that are taking care of all the last it could be a microphone on the drum kit it could be a rf problem uh even power and we're the last ones to say go we're ready yeah, the the monitor, the monitor tech is like the last line of defense, you know, and that's that's why we know we, you know, it's it's good to have good, you know, relationships with with all different people from different departments, because a lot of times I'm the last one on the stage before, you know, the camera cuts to that first shot. Right. Yeah. And I'll I'll add one quick thing to what Jason's talking about, which which is also good that you know jason mixes andre mixes they understand because they can put themselves in that situation of being a mixer and having to say yes or no to being able to do something but also that relationship we're talking about where andre jason uh dave ingles george schwartz those guys that always work billy that always work with us they know exact exactly what the answer is going to be to some of the questions or or requests that stage management let's say for instance might push if they couldn't answer the question for us on the spot it might turn into five minutes of waiting to get an answer directly from us while stage managers might say they might be already pushing the change through because they don't want to wait for an answer whereas if these guys right there last line of defense like you're saying can give the answer knowing full well what myself or Parker or somebody might say, you know, you've just eliminated all this extra time and you've quite possibly put a stop to something that would not work at all. You know, a lot of people come up with crazy ideas on shows and sometimes it's a little moment of reality that you have to do right there front and center. So that's part of a good relationship for sure. Perfect. We had a question come in that I realized that we didn't clarify. Anthony wants to clarify the Q mode setup for the in-ear packs. Are you using Q mode for each pack or is it the monitor tech pack? How is How are you doing that? Each pack? Every, every single pack, every pack ever that I use always, all the, all the frequencies in Q mode except for um there are there are times where we get on big shows and i won't put the desk cue which is the pack that the monitor mixer is using i won't put that in cue mode just because that has pl and a bunch of stuff running through it that nobody needs to hear unless you're already privy to that specifically you know so i will put all channels in all packs and then so the pack I can so I can use any pack for anything that I need um, for myself, and then I can give any pack to somebody else for anything else. Okay. Load all the time, every time. All right. Perfect. On a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we had another question uh, pertaining to award shows from Jamel. How many monitor de monitor desks are you using on award shows? Good question. Uh, prop just well. Normally, it's it's uh, on the big show would be two, two stages, two monitor mixed positions. But uh, sometimes there's you know it'd be one one. Uh, one position 
I can't think if there's any were there any time well, that we ever had three. I I would well, say it, I would say it this way: if you look back when in the analog days when there was a desk per act on, <laughs> remember in the Grammys up each uh, flight of seating, you know, backstage you'd have a console all subbed in to one master console. You'd be up to like sixteen back in those days. Yeah. Obviously, in the digital world, we've got it pretty much down to one digital mixing console with a, a mixer with an engineer per stage. So that's A stage, B stage performance. And then we trade off, we decide who's going to handle a satellite stage or a front of house stage or remote. Um, but that's pretty much what it's boiled down. Andre, you were going to, you were going to say, I was maybe. Gonna say unless, unless we have a guest engineer show up and they definitely oh. need their own console. Well, there's there's that's going to be like a huge A plus artist yeah. that's going to come in and say, you know, I, I want my own console. Besides yeah. that, it's one or two consoles, depending on how many stages we have. Yeah, yeah the, the consoles are so powerful. There's, it's it's the channel count so high that you can do it with with one one desk. Yeah, as long as you don't need a guest console. Yeah, the guest I, console I, thing definitely comes into play plenty of times, and yeah, well, that's a whole that's oh, a long, yeah. long conversation. <laughs> right on. Um, actually, speaking of multiple consoles, Tom, you sent me this picture. Do you want to talk a little bit about how uh, the monitor setup works uh, for for the halftime show? It looks like you have a couple desks going on. <laughs> um, yeah, this year was was a an odd year of rehearsal scheduling. So basically, there was an extra SD seven kicking around, not everybody has that problem, um, that he said, since it's here, you might as well hook it up and mirror it real time with the existing console that I had. So basically I had two SD7s running fully mirrored um, in case, you know, you don't just lose an engine, you lose an actual surface. Uh, so it was just a big fail safe. That's why that looks that way. Really, that show is done on one SD7 or one SD5 uh, Digico console. Um, and it's a cozy world. I will say that George Schwartz builds, um, you know, he's on that one. He's not just a monitor tech. He's like a, a project manager, production manager almost. Uh, and he goes in weeks ahead of time and creates a whole world where you're going to set up, you know, cause you're there for days on end rehearsing that, um, the halftime show, which, Parker and I have a long, rich history of going way back on halftime shows of, uh, you know, <laughs> I had I had the benefit of being on the field, creating the stage layout and dealing with the stage end of it for years and years. And Parker had mixed the halftime for, for years and years, you know, going back to when I was that kid, you know, coming up through MSI. I remember when Parker was, was uh, those are some funny early days. It gives you it gave me an opportunity to learn it from the field and the stage end on out to where when they uh, have gotten the halftime show to such a, a level that it is now, which is, again, production trying to make the biggest thing they possibly can. Um, it has, uh, you know, I always appreciate what goes on on the stage side, the field side in that case. And then, you know, I'm just in this small room right there trying to make things happen for people that are miles away, not miles, yards. Miles. Did I answer? <laughs> it seems like miles. <laughs> Did I answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, that's great. Actually, and since you, you bring up like for the Super Bowl, you're really far away from the field. Like I know with the Grammys, like Parker and Pisa are way up in like a couple, is up and then the stage is so far away like how you know how do you work out that communication from a team level you know because jason and andre you're really far away <laughs> from from the monitor mixers i think it goes back to the trust i mean we all have pls and, and we and we and we speak to each other and i think we have a pretty good idea i, I i've worked with 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 both Pisa and Parker, and and even though their um their work their workflow is is similar, there are certain different things between the both of them. So you know, I know that 
you know, one guy's going to want something a certain way. And, and so it's, it's just trying to, trying to make it feel like, even though we're, we're, um, we're far away in, in distance that it's, that it's not really that much, you know, there's, there's a lot of banter on PL and, and, you know, people are cracking jokes all while we're trying to, trying to make, you know, these big shows go. Um, and, and it's, and I think that it's all trying, trying to make sure that certain things don't get out of hand because, you know, Pisa saying that production's always trying to make the next biggest thing when it's really just, you know, it's, it's like, all right, it's, it's, it's another show, but there, there, every show is the best show. Every show is the best show. And so sometimes they get a little ahead of themselves and, and artists and, 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 and a lot of times they'll, there'll be people with artists that ask for things that aren't necessarily things that they need and they might not even know it. So <laughs> you have to, you, a lot, I think a, a lot of the gig is, is, is letting people think that they came up with a solution to their problem. Like you giving them a solution to their problem and then making them think that they came up with it. That's like one of the, one of the like little key touches. We're like, oh man, I think we should do that. When I, you know, I said it like five minutes ago, I'm like, man, that's a great idea. I think, I think we should do that. <laughs> and that, you know, something you're talking about, those conversations that happen on stage, let's say from, uh, from an artist rep or um, a guest uh, mixer, when you have a good relationship and those guys are on stage on headset relaying any request, <clears throat> and if you have faith that yes, that request is going to be executed quick and correctly, then they learn over time they don't need to be behind the console. So a situation like Super Bowl, where when they come on site the first day, days ahead of the first rehearsal, and they're like, "Man, how am I going to get between this console and out on the field during sound check? Like I can't do that." They start to come unravel, and you have to explain to them. The, you're on deck with the person. Your best place is for your artist to see your face. That calms them down. Anything you request that goes to that person on deck is getting to me, and I guarantee it'll happen. I'll, you know, it, that's the quickest way to do it. Sometimes they still decide to run back and forth, and they're out of breath by the you know third pass. But you know, everybody again, the ones that have been around it a long time that do get into the you know they they have no problem being on stage because. Like Jen asked, the communication is there. You know, there is a lot of communication on shows. There's no reason you can't talk to somebody to get something done. So the quickest way to do that is on on headset. You know, running back and forth, man, that just you know wears you out. For the birds. <laughs> it's for the birds. All your steps yeah, in. Some, some of the shows, it's, it's even easier when the monitor console with the engineers the furthest away from the stage. Because the closer you are to that stage with the console, you get bombarded by every engineer and every looky loo coming by and wants to know what's going on. What are you doing? And it distracts the engineer. The further away, the, the happier everybody seems to be. Yeah. And okay. The ones that want to butt in and go, go, I need, I need, I need, I need. And you're like, you know what? Hold on. I need. <laughs> <laughs> I need a. I need, I need Anita. A, there have yeah, been times, Anita. Where, you know, again, you go to a place like Super Bowl where RF World, um, Jen has seen this, is over on this side of the stadium. Monitor World's over on this side of the stadium. The stage is in the center of the field, and somebody comes flying into Monitor World out of breath <laughs> asking for the mic. I need the mic. And it's you just look at him for a minute, and you're like, <laughs> it's on the field. Like, it, there's a lot of people handling all this. The mic's on the field, so boom, they go running back. You know, click has already started. The song's getting ready to go. <laughs> right, kick, kick. Oh. All right, question for for you. Um, what's your advice to guest monitor engineers coming into an award show for the first time? Be cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say, right. I would say, trust your engineer and and trust your deck person. And, and be very, very communicative. Communicative? 
communicative. You, communicative. Thank you. you got it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, put the guy on stage, you know, and 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 your premixes. Make sure that your premixes are happy before you go out there. Yeah, and and that communication ahead of time, you know, when it is the guys that you know and they're comfortable and they know you, <clears throat> you come into a show a lot calmer. Yeah. There are some people if it's a new artist and they have somebody you've never met before. It could even be, you know, granted, when it's an artist's first tour, they may have the uh, a, a monitor mixer who has the best intentions, but they just haven't been through a lot of scenarios or situations. They've been on the road, right. had some great shows, but they haven't been in this whirlwind world of, of TV madness that, you know, my best thing that I try and tell them is just, look, you tell me what your artist wants and let me help guide you through this twisted path of TV and I have your back, you know, I definitely have your back. So if you go into it, not barnstorming saying, I got to do it this way, this, 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 come into it. Cool. Right. Jason's right. Come into it. Cool. And just say, what, how do I need to do this? Tell me if I'm out of, out of line asking for this, is it possible to have this external effect? You know, those types of things. There's a lot you can work out <clears throat> days ahead of time with simple email or phone calls that takes headaches out when you're on site, you know? So the early communication is probably one of the biggest ones I would say. Yeah. I have a story of uh, being at a gig. It's, it was the shrine uh, in, in LA here, but uh, there was, I'm not going to say the artist, but there was one guy who was a new artist. I mean, a new monitor engineer and he, was specific about I want to I need to to touch every knob and and EQ every everything you know just he wanted to do everything and I was like normally I don't let people do that but you know what I said you know what go ahead you know I, I already have it pre-dialed for you which we were talking about we kind of do a pre-dial in advance to help out artists from what we think is a good mix or a good starting point and this guy he he when i put him on the console okay so you have engineers that go super fast which are the truck engineers who are going kick and then snare and then guitar and ba you know they're doing they're eqing really quick because they know the dynamics of a, of a television show you don't have much time and this guy was on the kick drum when they were on guitars and he was, he melted, he melted down and was like, ah, oh, what are they doing? Boom, they got to slow down. And I finally had to say, listen, take a step back. Let me finish what, you know, what, what I started and uh, go from there. But some guys, you know, they, they get so caught up in mixing. I have to touch every knob and mix. you don't have that time in television at all. Zero. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's quite funny. Yeah. It's kind of weird because our time, we don't, like Parker said, we don't have that time. And our, really our time comes after the first pass. Usually we get four or five passes per song. After that first pass comes out, then we can all breathe together and, and work on the little nuances because it's going to take another 15, 20 minutes before we do another pass. Yeah. And and that that's usually when we can go in and start tweaking everybody's little ear mix. Yeah. And, and that conversation that happens ahead of time, you know, coming into it a, day, a couple of days before, our time on site days before, at least as a mixer, is spent programming as much as possible to where you're not taking a lot of time to do stuff. You know, high pass filters, certain EQs, things you can guarantee are going to work well until you need to tweak them. They're a great starting point. You know, as long as you can get that stuff out of the way, there's no need to stop and obsess on things. And uh, it, keeps, it keeps the time moving. Related to that, uh Shandana, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, asks, how does the workflow change doing tours versus television? And I know you touched on some of that. Um, Parker, I think you you did tours before yeah. uh, getting into TV. Like what are what are well, the big what are the big things? The the big differences of touring and uh, television, basically. Is that what perspective. You know, when you when you're touring, you're you're with you're with a band um, every single day. So you you 
you get into it's it's almost like kind of a laziness where you you relax uh you already know what every band member wants and you kind of fine tune a little or again it's more of um dealing on when you're on tour it's more of dealing with personalities <laughs> cuz you got to you you got to learn certain individuals personalities so you're with an you're with a band every day you can fine tune you kind of know what they want television is you sometimes have never even seen the artist you know or heard of the artist and you kind of have to uh again your your workflow is is uh pre-dialing and and doing what you think is best for that artist just from a starting point position you know what i mean and uh that's that's the biggest difference i see in touring is that you, you're with a, a band every day you you're a little bit more relaxed depending on the artist <laughs> now there's some certain artists that are just a headache that the touring guys know what i'm talking about but you you're more relaxed where television it is more of a a, a stressful ah you know you're kind of like uh keeping up with production so those are the big differences is uh, touring i would say you're a little bit more relaxed where you you understand the artists, you understand the band members, but come uh, television, it is like, you know, you've never seen these people before. So you kind of have to go, what's good for this guy? What's good for that guy? And I think your mixing skills, you know, come into play where uh, you pre-dial uh, a mix for a certain individual and you know that that might be a good starting point. Sometimes it's not. But in most of the time, it's a, it's a good starting point. Yeah, I'd say usually we're pretty pretty close. Yeah. Well, I've had some that were like, you know what? You know, I don't want no drum. This is a drummer. So I don't need any drums in my in my mix. And you're kind of going, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, I could easily, you know, take that out. But you you get some certain people like that. They're like, you know, or or you know. I, I need the guitar on the left side only, you know, and my guitar just just take it out because he's you know he's loud enough on stage. But anyway, you, know, you get certain stuff like that. But those are the big differences for touring and and uh, television. Television is more stressful where you have to really manage your your time. Where touring, you uh, you're a little bit more relaxed, I would say. All right. Perfect. I'm going to bring up another picture here just because I just uh -oh. think it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Jason, yeah. you said this was the Emmys. What's, what's happening here? <laughs> so, uh, that's me. That's me at the Emmys. I do that one with Parker. And um, it started off and I was like, yeah, it's going to be easy. I'm the, I'm the only tech on that show. It's a, it's a one monitor mixer show. It's gonna be easy. We only have like, you know, this act where, you know, maybe it'll be three packs the whole show. Like it's it's nothing like the AMAs or the Grammys where we have like a huge rack of transmitters twelve. So you know, it's it's usually not as involved as maybe the Grammys. Usually maybe. And so all of a sudden they're like, well, we have a a marching band. And. Oh <laughs> and we need to do a pre-record of this marching band. I'm like, all right, well then, you know, I need more packs. Well, how many people are in? And it's like, I don't know, it's 30, 40 people, something like that. So we get all these packs down. All of them need generics, which is a blast. Everybody loves that. So, so what do you mean when you say need generics? What is that for those so, people? So there's basically two type of in-ear monitors you have the the generic kind that w are made to fit anybody you can go and buy them anywhere like guitar center or whatever they have them it's it's more like your your ipod buds but don't 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 use those on a stage but anyways those are the generics and they have a foam tip that comes off that can be taken off and put a new one on to give to anybody, like this. And then there are molded ears 
that are specifically molded to your ear. Those are personal molded in-ears. So all these people have generics, so that means I have to take care of them and I have to manage them. So that was after a, a rehearsal, I believe, where I had to put all the packs and generics on everybody in the, in the marching band. And then after they finished, I had to take them all off. And I did that multiple <laughs> times throughout the week. And that's what it looked like right when I took it off. And then I had to, you know, I clean it up and, 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 and clean them and take off the tips and make sure everything's good and nothing's broken and then do it all over again. I should, I should have sent the, the after picture because the after picture looks very nice. <laughs> no. Andre's gone. No, no, no nasty. <laughs> yeah. That's like people, I think, uh, I think Steve Anderson took that picture. He was like, wait, stop. Hold on. <laughs> Disaster. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. All right, so I wanna to pivot to um, variety shows and talk a little bit about um, Jason and Parker. You're both on AGT. Um, Parker, you're at the front of house, right? Right, right. Yep. So how does that, how do monitors in front of house work together? Like they, I, they certainly affect each other. So. You, yeah, learning from uh, uh, engineer Patrick Baltzell, you learn from a monitor's point of view, you, you kind of, you learn what affects the front of house in different ways. So, um, when you're at front of house, you start hearing, you know, different frequencies and stuff like that, that might, uh, you know, might interfere with how you want to mix at front of house. So um, if there's, you know, if there's some low end frequencies and stuff like that, that are, that are bothersome, uh, that could be a problem when you're at front of house. You know, you start hearing something that, that might be taken off and it really isn't. Um, you kind of have to, you know, listen closely or tell someone to maybe high pass uh, certain frequencies to help you out at front of house. So those are, you know, those are little things that you learn over the years of uh, uh, what works and what not, what doesn't work. You know, from a monitor's in a point of view, uh, you, you kind of want to have to try and be as clean as possible, meaning your frequencies. Uh, you know, try not to have something super bright that uh, the high end's bouncing off of a, a certain set piece uh, versus, you know, low end building up and you're, you know, it's, it, low end's normally a slow build. So by the time you hear it, it's pretty full on, you know, feedback. But you, you learn to work together like that, you know, uh, one helping the other. So. I'll just say that is is really connecting with if you have a good monitor engineer and you're in front of house, then you know things lock up uh, quite easily. But if you have a person you know on monitors and uh, they're you know they're they're not doing a great job, then it could be very difficult for you you know uh, to mix front of house to get levels that you want. You know, either one, you got to get over the monitor mix, uh, the monitor mixer, which thus is normally too loud or something like that. You've been, a, I think, Jen, you've been to AG, AGT where it's like, you know, we're screaming out at front of house, you know, super loud. But uh, in that situation, it might not be uh, uh, too drastic. So where, where the monitors might not be too drastic. So go from there. Yeah, at HET, I'm actually I'm actually technically slated as a monitor tech, and Jason Badian's the engineer, and then I'm the, I'm the engineer on the mass singer. But I have mixed at AGT, and I know that um, it's exactly what Parker said. Like a, a lot of times, you don't need a bunch of low end or 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 high end necessarily coming out of the side fills on the stage because um, 
all, especially, you know, if, if there's a dance act or something like that, all they need to know is basically where they are in the song. And because we're in a theater, you'll get, you'll get, you'll get energy from the PA, that low end energy, you'll get that from the PA. So you don't need to have a lot of that on the stage. Um, and, and you also want to make sure that you're not, like Parker said, interfering too much with what, what's going on in, out in the house, because you have the judges out in, in the house and it, it's, it's, it's a, a balance between trying to keep the, um, the contestants, people on stage, giving them everything that they need, but not interfering with the, the, um, what you need to hear out in the house in the different places in the house and then not interfering with what's going on in the truck that goes out to people at home. Okay. Uh, some more questions that came in. Uh, this is from George Swartz. <laughs> oh, Georgie. Uh, so George asks, do you feel there is more pressure doing monitors than front of house? Dun, dun, dun. You know, that's a, that's, that's a good question. I think, it's different. It's different. It's a different pressure. Our pressure on state or as a monitors, I think it's we have to be up and going now. I think the right. pressure at, at the pressure at front of house is this how it's sounding. Um, right. Yep. And I think it's also different because we, we have communication with the artists on stage, so they're pretty much telling us how it is that they want it to sound in each artist. So. We have that communication. We're at front of house. They don't really have that communication. And you have five, six, seven different people telling you how it's supposed to sound. Yeah, you, you're when you're mixing front of house, uh, you have exactly what Andre said. You have, you know, five, six, seven people telling you, you know, you have a, a, a studio engineer, the front of house engineer, the, you know, uh, management. That's saying, oh, it should sound this way, or you, you, you know, it should sound like this. And then on stage, the artist is telling you exactly what it needs to sound like in their in ears or in their wedges on stage. So uh, I would say pressure-wise, it's it's a it, monitors is a, 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 a probably a little bit more pressure. I feel because uh, you're definitely working closer with the with the artists on what they want and you sometimes you 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 struggle to find exactly what they want uh in their inners meaning how they want it to sound it might be nowhere near what you think is good <laughs> or bad you know but uh so i would say monitors is probably a little bit more uh, pressure intense all right uh, Another one from George, uh, which I, I like this one quite a bit. Uh, why did you guys all choose the monitor end of the snake? <laughs> Best place to be, man. Because nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I'll, I'll answer this one, really. I Honestly, when I hearken back to those Maryland sound days where, where it was a touring business, and there were all these great engineers, both front of house and monitor, and everybody was a character. They were all really good mixers, really good engineers. <clears throat> but I always felt when you were backstage or si side of the stage at a show, the action, the <clears throat> comedy, just, man, it's like a live wire when you're just around all this stuff actually happening. Being a drummer and feeling the energy of the real acoustic drums on the stage coupled with you making something out of it and, and consoles. And back then it was more wedge oriented than ear oriented. So, you know, you're making a whole world up there with these musicians and it's just kicking and it's, it feels good. And then you go out the front of house and, you know, everybody does things different. Everybody's into different stuff. I always felt it was a little detached, a little like I even called it. I said front of house is like an Island. It's an Island in the middle of all this stuff. It sounds beautiful. It's all, wonderfully done but it's just a little detached you know things could get a little more serious out there nobody's having that much fun man backstage there's a party going on and there's a lot of people like cracking each other up 
and making some good stuff out of it. I always gravitated toward that, that end of it. It, it can be way harder. You know, it depends on the act and what you're doing. It's challenging. I love, you know, the challenge of it. And it just, it kept my interest. I will jokingly, I said, because nobody wanted to do it. I think a lot of times it's like, here, you, you go do that, go do monitors. The, the adage is, Oh, monitors, that's a young man's game, you know, but I stuck with it because I, I literally get a good jolt out of it. I, I enjoy it. I think, you know, a lot of good stuff comes from that starting point of the stage. So. Yeah, for yeah. me, I I just from rehearsals to to the stage. I mean, it always. It sucked me in. I think it chose me, not the other way. Yeah, right. A lot of people go, oh, you know, oh, I mix monitors before. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mix monitors uh, before uh, for so and so, and you're like, uh, okay, well, why'd you stop? And it's normally because they suck. So, <laughs> but anyway, I'll tell you, you do have to have thick skin, and, and you know, yeah, yeah, put so your armor time. armor on. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't take anything personally. You know, artists are always going to hear things differently and uh and that's either legitimate or not you know a lot of it's psychoacoustic so on it it's you got to deal with a lot and you do have to have some thick skin and uh yeah if you can forge through that and still have fun with it then yeah, it's very gratifying definitely i think that i think the monitors is I, I i do love the challenge and 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 you know it's like sometimes artists are coming out there and they're they're having a bad day you know even before they hit the stage and and being able to work through that and 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 get them to a point where you know they're more relaxed and they're happy and 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 maybe not so so grumpy about something i think that's a win so i i, I i've always liked monitors i wouldn't i wouldn't trade it up for for a different um tech position at all I, I i like where where i'm at in it uh some advice for those who are getting into doing monitors what is uh your favorite or must-have tool in your gig bag must have must have wow i think you just gotta you know do it a bunch. <laughs> do it a bunch do it a lot and and get 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 your workflow that's streamlined and get your process that works where you can get to where you need to go quickly. Hey, you know, I can go I, I, I can go backwards on this question. And I'll give you the simplest answer because, <clears throat> again, I did learn back when people were just listening. They weren't analyzing. They weren't looking. You know, I think don't let your bag get too big where you're lugging it in and setting all this stuff up. <laughs> And you're looking at it all, but you're not listening. So honestly, the best tool in your bag, there's two of them right here. Always listen. And that's true. Yeah, that, I had to go backwards on it because I feel mm -hmm. every tool is is a benefit that you can use. And when you learn how to use it, analyze things correctly, there's no doubt that that's a benefit that's going to help you. <clears throat> but it does take time. Every additional tool that you add is another step to use. So start at the fundamentals and don't, you know, don't uh, ignore what you're hearing. That's it. All right. I would say that's all. That's that's definitely it. Okay. Uh, well, one last question to close. Actually, now that Andre is not on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at what? the office. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. What do you have a must-have tool advice for uh, monitor new monitor folks? Uh, must-have is a Jason or a Billy or a Manny. On stage. <laughs> <laughs> good point. All right. Oh, good good point. <laughs> Eyes on the stage. Eyes and ears on the stage. Yeah. That's your most important tool is that guy on stage. Right on. All right. Uh, so to close it out, one last question for all of you. This is, of course, a Sure webinar. So what is your favorite Sure product? Ooh, what thousands. All day. One, yeah. 
PSM 1000. I, I, I'm, I would not do a TV show without them. Okay. So true. Not happily, at least. Uh oh, going to get it. <laughs> that. Yes, there it is. <laughs> that. Oh, me. You know, granted, the PSM 1000 revolutionized, and, and I'm not just saying that, revolutionized <laughs> how, on, how the systems work and how reliable they are and everything else. And it became an industry standard. I love that part of it. Guest engineers like it. But whenever anybody's having trouble getting something to work right, when that comes out, yeah. <laughs> right? Fine. Yeah. A standard. Yeah. Nice. I think I think Jason went to go get his. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I should go up to my office and get my yeah, that that's fifty eight. Yeah. All right. There he is. <laughs> I know, I got a fifty seven. I had to look for my fifty eight. <laughs> I got one of these too. I love them. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, Tom, Parker, Jason, Andre, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, just a little housekeeping for those of you who are tuning in. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining our webinar. Uh, just a reminder, the first uh, the first and third Tuesdays of every month, we have our Sure Pro Tech Talk, which is our market development team just having an open forum. You can come in, ask us any question. We'll try to address it during that time. And then you're already here with our Friday webinars. We're, we're doing workflow series. And next week, we're doing drive-in concerts, uh, which is kind of the new thing right now. And then uh, when we hit into August, we're gonna start it off with uh, Q5X, which is a new uh, part of the Axiant Digital family and then has some specialty applications around sports broadcast. So uh, thank you all very much for joining. Andre, Tom, Jason, and Parker, thank you so much for, the, for doing this. And uh, we'll see you all no next problem. week. Thanks for having us. Very fun. All right. Thank you, everybody.